So, uh, good evening, folks. Welcome back to another session of uh, the Div 176 uh, lecture series, 2021 lecture series. Uh, I think you guys all know me. My name is Nick Hume. I'm a paramedic based in Victoria with Division 176. I'm a provincial staff officer with St. John Ambulance uh, BC Yukon. Uh, and joining us tonight, uh, we have uh, Bobby Bennett. Bobby is a uh, Lieutenant with the Canadian Armed Forces and is a uh, nurse in the emergency departments here in Victoria. Um, I think you're working both sites now, aren't you, Bobby? Victoria, yes. Yeah. Um, as you guys can tell, or as you guys know, Bobby's going to be uh, presenting uh, uh, emergency management of burns to us this evening. Um, also, as I'm sure you guys are familiar, if you've, uh, if you've joined us previously, uh, we are now offering CME credits to, uh, to our members who are licensed <clears throat> uh, by the province of British Columbia as either paramedics or emergency medical responders or higher. Um, so what that means is if you are a licensed PCP or EMR and you need CME credits, um, at some random point throughout tonight's lecture, we will take a brief break, do a random attendance to make sure that nobody's showing up doing attendance and then leaving. Um, and uh, we will issue you guys a certificate um, acknowledging that you were here, detailing uh, what, uh, what the content of tonight's talk was. EMA licensing does have final say on how many credits they will issue you for, uh, for this session. So some sessions will be worth 0.5, others will be worth one or two. Um, it is up to EMA licensing's discretion. Um, again, only folks who are licensed, we do have to hand cut these certificates as it were. Uh, so only folks who actually have a license and need CME credits, please fill out the attendance or please do the attendance stuff. Um, if you don't need a certificate saying you were here, please don't because it just makes more work for really just me. Uh, um, as always, guys, we're going to ask everyone to keep your microphones and cameras off throughout the talk. Um, if you have questions, please put them into the group chat. Um, and either Bobby will be paying attention or and reading them herself, or I'll be sort of curating questions if uh, um, if uh, if she's focusing on her presentation. And with that, guys, I'm going to turn my camera and my mic off. I'm going to hand you over to uh, Bobby Bennett talking to us about emergency management of burns. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as Nick said, my background is primarily emergency room. I work in both the emergency rooms in Victoria. I also do some emergency and ICU nursing in some of the remoter areas of British Columbia in the interior and up north. And I work with the military training the um, medical technicians and with the search and rescue technicians. So by admission, uh, my, my practice is in hospital. I do teach pre-hospital, but unlike many of you who work work there, I do not. So if I miss anything or if I make a mistake that way, I apologize. Feel free to ask questions or point that out. Um, this is a huge topic. Obviously, burns is absolutely massive. Even emergency management of burns, kind of that initial management, which is what I'm hoping to focus on, is quite a bit. There's quite a bit more detail than just takes up an hour. So the way that I've organized this in an attempt to give you the, the most amount of information, the least amount of time is to actually do pre-hospital immediate care of burns. Uh, this is just what happens right away. And it's not just focusing so much on burns specifically, but your, your management of a, a trauma in general, because we often forget when we're learning about burns that it's often mixed with something else. You very rarely see a very isolated burn particularly if you're looking at something like the incident in the picture here. And so I'd like to mix it into your trauma assessment. And I know that we have a lot of people from a lot of backgrounds. So I've tried to make it a mixture of simple to complicated. If I lose anyone, please feel free to ask questions. I'm gonna try and keep everybody interested. Uh, the priority being on the beginning of the presentation. And then we're gonna delve a little bit more into the anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology of the secondary management of burns. And if that's not your area, you can feel free to listen to me less as the PowerPoint goes on. So, let's see if I can... all right, there we go. Burns specifically are just that damage to the endo, endothelium, oh, 
shoot, sorry, obviously I'm not technologically competent here. Um, damage to the skin and the underlying tissues. So one of the special mentions I'd like to make is for cold injuries. Uh, we often think of thermal burns as always being hot, but if you're looking at your severe cold injuries like frostbite, that can actually be classified as a burn as well because you are just killing off you know, your skin. Uh, primarily in North America, when the civilian population encounters severe burns, it's usually from residential fires, from house fires. And a lot of people who die in those incidents die right away. Um, the important thing being that the people who don't die immediately, the people who do need that care, the initial management of burns is very important. And we know that what happens in those first few hours will affect those people going forwards and affect their outcomes. So this is something that you don't necessarily get to see those outcomes. You don't necessarily get to see whether that patient is well, but it is really important that your practice be really thorough here for for that for the outcome of these patients. Just trying to get my computer to work here. So just kind of briefly going over the types of burns because this makes a big difference, not just to um, how you're going to manage it, but also how you're going to protect yourself. Uh, thermal being that steam, smoke, flash, scald. Uh, again, though, also cold injuries. We can cl classify the cold injuries under there as well. Chemical, uh, this is something you'll notice some of the terms in here, by the way, I have used this PowerPoint with the military in case you're wondering why sometimes we talk about some chemical warfare. Um, I'll fly over that a little bit, but if anyone's interested, I can ask questions about it later. Um, so a good example of chemical, for instance, something that you might encounter in the community when I was working in the emergency room in Kelowna, the Sunripe factory actually had a chemical spill where they had chlorine and ammonia from the cleaning cart, huge buckets of it actually fall over and mix together and had quite a few people come in. Um, we called it a mass casualty, but I think we had a total of six people. So it was a bit of a light, the light side of a mass casualty um, where we had quite a few people come in with chemical burns. Um, so that's, if you're, if you're thinking that maybe you're not gonna see that outside of a military, military background, you may still. Electrical, obviously we see this with people who are working on electrical or if you're a uh, lightning strike. And then radiation, a uh, really common one, sunburns. And you know what? People can do some surprising thing, things with sunburns, particularly when alcohol is involved. You'd be surprised how often I get people into the emergency room who actually do need to be acutely treated with just a sunburn. Um, so, Kind of getting into your meat and potatoes here, as it were. This is the as we like the important step is that this is part of your trauma assessment. You are not going to walk into a situation and think I'm caring for a burn. This is a burn. Very rarely, anyways, are you going to do that. Particularly if it's if you're looking at something that um, needs immediate and acute care. It's part of your trauma assessment, so it needs to be sunk into the assessment. Whatever assessment, whatever your background is. Um, whether you be a uh, paramedic or nurse or St. John's ambulance and you don't have the same, if you just have EMR training, uh, whatever your algorithm for that is, the one that we use is A, B, C, D, E. If yours is different, you just take burn and you sink it into that and you don't forget about that trauma assessment. And burns are big, fancy, distracting injuries. You're going to see it. A lot of the time it can be very difficult to see and it's very difficult for the patient who's in quite a, can be quite uncomfortable and quite focused on the burn themselves. But uh, as one of uh, one emergency room physician at one point said, if somebody fell down the stairs, getting out of the burning house and you focus on the burns and you miss the fact that they've got a bunch of fractures from falling down said, said, falling down said stairs, you're going to lose that patient because you've been, you've allowed that distracting injury essentially to distract you. Um, so also with almost any kind of burn again, and I harp on this a lot when I, when I speak to just about any kind of trauma assessment is that you need to keep yourself safe first. This is even more important. If I don't know what burned that person, but it can burn you just as easily. And you becoming a casualty makes the situation a great deal worse running straight into a situation and trying to 
save lives when you haven't managed whatever the stimuli is that's causing the burn in the first place is not going to help anyone. Another really good safety consideration here is that people with burns don't have their skin, which means the fluid from inside their body is coming out. Everything essentially has become a mucous membrane. That patient is now a lot more likely, particularly if they have any kind of bloodborne infection, to be able to infect you. So it's even more important for you to be wearing that eye I wear that mask, gown, whatever kind of PPE it is that you're using, you need to be very aware of that. And then initially, as soon as you assure you're safe, you need to ensure they're safe. Is what burnt them on them still, particularly if you're looking at chemicals, are they still on, are they still on that patient? If it's something burning, if it's something hot, is it still on that patient? Remove it without injuring yourself and remove it without further injuring the patient, remove them from that stimulus, stimulus essentially. Uh, this is often done with copious amounts of water, but again, in some instances like a chemical burn, it could be a dry powder in case, what you, in which case you want to dust it off of the person. You have to adjust for the type of burn that you're looking at. So almost everyone's trauma assessment, a lot of the time what we start with is C and that instead of airway, we do that, you know, the massive, the massive bleeding. Same thing, ensure that there's no ex massive, massive external hemorrhage. And then you move to airway, which what we're going to do now is kind of discuss as you go through that trauma assessment, I'm gonna discuss the, the trauma assessment that I've set up is actually the one that we use in the military. Uh, it's very similar. You can adjust it for the one that you've been taught. And we're just going to go into specific considerations for burns built into the assessment that you should be looking at. Uh, so again, airway includes C-spine. So immediately this person, if there's some kind of associated trauma, you still need to be holding C-spine. You still need to be opening that airway. Um, the specific thing that can, burns can affect here is something called inhalation injury. So if someone has thermal burns in particular, if someone has thermal burns on their body, they can also have thermal burns in their airway. Uh, if they've gone up like this, they've taken a big deep breath. What have they brought in? They might have brought some of that temperature. They but a lot of the time people will actually inhale burning, um, burning matter, burning gases. Uh, again, with chemical burns, you're looking at whatever has gotten into that airway and can be causing damage in there as well. And you can't see that where you can see that surface burn. Um, a lot of the time with burns, I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you initially burn yourself, if it's like something minor in the kitchen, it doesn't look too bad. And then all of a sudden it gets red, it gets more painful, it begins to blister after a day or two, it's looking its worst. It's the same thing with burns everywhere else. And it's the same thing with burns in on the interior, in your mouth, in your lungs. And so it's just because someone appears well initially and often a burn patient will initially look well, doesn't mean that they are going to continue to look well. So the issue with those airway burns is that you're gonna see them get worse. And if you don't take airway into account very early and the stabilization of that, airway into account very early, you might not be able to stabilize it later. Um, okay, so if we're dealing with uh, burns to the head and neck area and C-spine, how do we go about dealing with the C-spine? Excellent question. I mean, it's gonna be on a bit of a case by case basis, but let's say if you have the people for someone to be able to maintain that C-spine manually, instead of putting that collar on, that may be a really good idea because what we know about those C-spine collars is that you get those areas of pressure, right? Even in someone whose skin's intact, we're already breaking down skin when we leave someone in those collars for a long period of time. So if that skin's not intact, we're, we're going to have even more of an issue. So we don't always have the luxury of having that extra person to hold that manual C-spine, in which case you can do, you've got the I don't know what everyone everywhere uses, but you've got the two fo white foam rollers you can use. To be honest with you, two bags of saline on either side of the head. Is the patient agitated? Are they moving that head around? Is that something you need to take into account? Um, and then Carly. Okay, Carly, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> we'll, we'll cover that at the end. Um, so, the high index of suspicion, I will mention recently, uh, getting a little bit more into hospital instead of pre-hospital, is we used to say anybody with any kind of uh, inhalation injury, any kind of airway contact with that uh, thermal 
thermal burn. We just intubated them. We intubated them right away. ALS, same thing. It was a very early intubation. We're starting to realize now that not every person with an inhalation injury or an airway injury needs to be instantly intubated, but it is something we need to have a very high index of suspicion for. Because if you have the, if you have the equipment, if you have the people, uh, if particularly if it's going to take you a long time to extricate a patient or you're not going somewhere where they have a lot of resources, it's something you want to take into consideration now. If you can safely put in an advanced airway in a patient, then you want it. It's better to do that early than it is to find out later that that airway is closed on you because of that inhalation injury and now you can't. And that is eventually some of these patients with these severe inhalation injuries will actually close that airway entirely and you will no longer have an option of placing an airway at all. One kind of side note, an interesting, interesting point, chlorine gas, again, something that's used in chemical warfare in the military, but also used in a lot of industrial uh, plants like that sunripe accident I had mentioned. Chlorine gas when inhaled causes pseudomembrane formation from the sloughing of the dead cells in the airway from the inhalation of that gas and that pseudomembrane will actually completely block that airway and you won't be able to intubate that patient and depending on where the pseudomembrane is or where that blockage occurs you may or may not even have the option to cricortrate that patient at that point so getting to that early getting through there and establishing that airway is something that you do need to consider um, so this is a really painfully obvious case of the fact that this particular individual has encountered a thermal injury to their face, but it's a really good example of all the textbook reasons we say you need to consider inhalation injury in a patient. Facial burns, singed nasal hair, carbonaceous sputum, that just means that the sputum is black or gray. Um, soot around the mouth, charring, the mucosa, the red mucosa, you get this like beet red kind of on the inside and the back of the throat. You'll see that's beefy is the word they use for it. Uh, it's something they're looking for when they're looking for these types of injuries. Someone who is a hoarse voice. That's always a big, one of the first big things that's a triage that I'll notice in a patient who's inhaled something in a house fire is that their voice will start to change. You don't know what everyone's voice sounds like. So it's worth asking them, does your voice sound different to you or somebody who's with them that knows them? Does their voice sound different? Is it quieter? Is it hoarse? And a cough, obviously, though. Anytime that you have someone who's had a little bit of, who's inhaled a bit of smoke, you may, you may see that. I have a really good kind of anecdote for this one. We had uh, an elderly woman, Victoria, who was cooking after drinking a fairly copious amount of red wine. And she had left her plastic cutting board, I don't know if you know the old plastic cutting boards, on the stove on top of a burner she didn't realize was on, and it caught fire. And she, she was, um, an older English lady and was not to be out, was was not to be run out of her house by this stove fire. So she went about trying to put it out herself, and she came in just covered in this kind of like black sooty mess because it was where the plastic from the cutting board had gotten all over her. Now on her face specifically, on her mouth and her teeth, they were really discolored. There was a very dark discoloration, and she had that very beefy color to the inside of her mouth. But she had no difficulty breathing at all. She denied feeling like she'd inhaled anything. She was speaking very normally. She had very good vital signs. And so we were doing that, do we airway, do we not airway? When one of the residents actually found, went, wait a second, this woman drinks quite a bit of red wine every night. She had discoloration on her lips and her teeth and the inside of her mouth because she'd had like three bottles of red wine that night. So what we were seeing was red wine changes and not changes from an actual inhalation injury. So it's very important, always assess your patients just because the textbook lists off if they have these symptoms, have a look at the patient. Someone who has had some kind of inhalation injury, if they're awake, is probably going to be able to tell you that that hurts or that they felt like they inhaled something, they'll have an increased work of breathing. You have, to, you have to include that in that initial assessment. Going kind of further into that, an inhalation injury does not stop at the airway, it gets into the lungs, becomes very important for your respiratory assessment as well. And so again, it's this inhalation injury is not just direct contact with that heat. There's a bunch of particulate in the air, 
there's toxins in the air and chemical burns. So a gas that you can inhale is still a burn. It's still that inhalation injury. Also with these thermal burns, when you have, and we're going to talk a lot about fires, we're going to talk about because the majority of people who do end up having these severe burns are usually in a residential house fire. Uh, we're going to talk about that a fair bit. So one of the big things you have to take into consideration is that fire is sucking all the oxygen out of the air. So they could be sitting there and they can be breathing, but there's no oxygen in it. And so they're still suffering from that hypoxia, depending on where in and around that fire they are. Carbon monoxide and cyanide poisoning are also really important to mention when we talk about residential fires, because the things that houses are made of contain materials that when they burn, have car um, release carbon monoxide and cyanide. And to keep things relatively simple, carbon monoxide and cyanide will attach to your hemoglobin, but they'll do it more strongly than oxygen will. And so that means that even if you have oxygen floating around, it's not going to be able to attach to your hemoglobin, get into your blood, and then your blood circulating, though it may be, is not going to be able to actually provide you with that oxygen. We call this chemical asphyxiation. It's someone who's sitting there and they're breathing in front of you, but they're still not actually getting any oxygen. Carbon monoxide is four times more, four times happier to sit on that hemoglobin than oxygen is. So all you have to do is put four oxygens in the air for the carbon monoxide to be able to boot it off. So this is one of the few times I endorse doing the firefighter method. I apologize if anyone's a firefighter, I'm gonna make fun of you a little bit and throw 15 liters of oxygen by face mask on everybody. We know that we don't generally like to just hammer oxygen onto anyone anymore that people having MIs and strokes, it actually harms them. It doesn't help them in this particular instance. If you have any kind of suspicion of um, chemical thermal burn, then you, this is when you get to just huck as much oxygen on them as you want. And you need to keep that oxygen on for a long period of time as well, in case they have those chemicals in their system. Now, cyanide poisoning specifically is not going to react to that. It's going to attach to those hemoglobin quite a bit more, basically in such a way that no matter how much oxygen you give, it is not going to be reversed. It's We reverse that with the medication you need to give in the hospital. And the next slide, I've actually got a picture. We'll talk a little bit more about that cyanide poisoning. The last thing about the respiratory, so we talk about when you're looking at your respiratory system, you're looking at how that person's breathing, you're looking at the rate, you're looking at the depth, you're looking at whether they're having trouble. So one of the things that can affect the respiratory system when you're looking at a burn specifically is if you have burns all across the chest, specifically all across the chest and all the way over the back. Burned skin, burned tissue hardens. And so you can imagine it would be like wearing a corset and as that tissue hardens, your lungs aren't actually able to fully expand. And so someone, again, who's maybe breathing, maybe their lungs haven't been affected, isn't actually going to be able to expand their lungs. And so their ventilation is not going to be acceptable for that reason. Um, and that's something that you need to take into account. There's a picture, again, coming up later. We'll warn anyone who's a little bit squeamish. There are some, we always take the, take the chance when we do teaching on burns to show some of the really gross pictures. I do have a chest plate escherotomy I'm going to show later. If uh, anyone's a bit squeamish pre-warning, some of the burn pictures can be a little bit, a little bit difficult to look at. And so again, we're going to cover that in more detail as I get to get to that slide. But what you really want to make sure you do here is put on that 100% oxygen, have a good listen to the lungs if you get that chance, because Again, we talk about how these injuries progress. If you can get a good early listen to those lungs, then you know if it's changing. So if that patient at the beginning, their lungs sounded fine and an hour in, all of a sudden you're starting to hear differences in the lungs, that's a change. You know it's getting worse. That could lead you to decide whether to place an airway or whether you need to get that person to um, more definitive care or not. So trying to get that kind of early, even if it's a quick assessment is a good idea. This is this picture I was talking about of cyanide poisoning. Um, they get this cherry red look to their skin and it's got to do with because the cyanide is um, because of the way it's attached to the hemoglobin, I believe that you get this coloration of the skin. And so again, you get these people who look pink um, hypoxic people should be blue, right? When we're looking at someone who's not getting enough air, when we're 
we're seeing someone with cyanosis, we're seeing somebody who's pale. Um, and so when you get not only cyanide poisoning, but someone with second degree burns, it can be, or you've seen someone with third degree burns, you can't look at that skin anymore and try and decide whether that person is breathing effectively because of the color. So it kind of takes that away from you, that ability to assess that way. And that's something to keep in mind. Um, one of the early, I, it's worth mentioning, I think that the earliest signs of like someone may be breathing, someone may be talking to you, but one of the earliest signs that they're not getting enough oxygen is a change in level of consciousness. A change in level of consciousness does not mean falling unconscious in front of you. The change in level of consciousness you'll most likely see with someone who's not getting enough oxygen is anxiety. These patients can seem, un, how do I professionally say, uh, difficult to deal with. Often a patient who's refusing to be looked at, who wants to stand, who wants to walk away from you, who wants to do something, who has an unreasonable request, like the need to find their wallet. And you can't distract them from the idea that they need to find that wallet. It's a mistake, A, to let them get up and move around because if they're not getting enough oxygen, moving around will make that even worse. And B, to not try and control that person and calm them down, control that anxiety, because it may be born of a lack of oxygen. They may not be thinking correctly. And so at that point, you need to kind of take that situation into control and try and oxygenate that person and see if that will calm them down. When we talk about work of breathing, I don't know if everyone, if you've heard of accessory muscle use, you see it in the shoulders, you see it in the belly, you see in drawing in kids or uh, tracheal tug, anytime you see any kind of asymmetrical movement basically on the chest when somebody's trying to breathe, that's a sign that something isn't going well. Again, these are all early signs. You might see someone who doesn't really seem burnt, doesn't have those nice textbook black things on their face, but you know, you're just seeing the shoulders go more, you're noticing. And again, we don't all like to count the amount of respirations, but actually spend that 30 seconds to count the amount of respirations because you know what, 24, 26 respirations doesn't look that different than 18 respirations. You have to take that second, particularly in children to actually count that. That's what you're gonna notice. You're gonna see an anxious patient. You're gonna see someone who is using extra muscles to breathe. Uh, you need to be picking up at those points that this person is having some kind of problem. You don't want to wait until you have a drowsy patient whose respirations have gone from being fast to being slow because they're starting to give up in front of you. You need to have, that, again, high index of suspicion for airway and respiratory issues in these patients. Um, and again, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat myself consistently here. It, this slide kind of says things I've already covered obstruction is something that we see either from the slough, sloughing of the dead skin cells or maybe even inhalation of that particulate from that fire. And so the obstruction can, depending on where the obstruction lodges, you can hear or not hear different things in the lungs. You're not going to be able to, if there's an obstruction, you're not going to be able to hear air entry past that. If you're starting to see bronchospasm and um, the bronchi, uh, bronchioles getting smaller, you're going to hear wheezes. If you hear a bunch of different types of wheezes, instead of just the one, it means there's different size airways involved. So instead of just one air, like one, the smaller part of the airway or the bigger part of the airway, if you're hearing a bunch of different kind of notes in there, it means that we've got all that lung being involved now. Uh, pulmonary edema, when you inhale a bunch of smoke, you actually, you're, you lose surfactant, which is the the moisture on the inside of your alveoli and your lungs that keep them from collapsing shut and then your body doesn't make it as well when it gets damaged afterwards and so you're a lot more likely to see the alveoli collapse when you have an inhal inhalation injury you're going to hear crackles uh, when that happens and acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, is when someone is essentially as we get like further and further into this process basically the, the loss of elasticity of the lungs the inability to move air in and out. Often it's better in these guys if you're hearing a bunch of wheezes, if you're hearing popping and snapping, because that means at least there's air getting in there. It's a lot more worrisome if you're hearing a quiet chest. It's like, do I actually hear that? Is something, is something going on in there? If you're not hearing anything at all, it might not mean that you have good air entry. It might mean that you have no air entry. And so that's something to be taking into account as well. And then we talked about um, burns decreasing chest wall expansion, which is what we get into here. Here's the picture I was warning everyone about. 
So again, this is probably not going to happen in the field. We know it has uh, military wise. This is something that has had to be done in the field before we ideally we do not. So this individual has got third degree burns circumferentially. You'll hear circumferential a lot from me today. Circumferentially means all the way around. And so what we're looking at is someone who can't actually physically breathe because the skin has lost its elasticity. And so it can't actually let the lungs widen. Um, and so what we do, it's, it's a relatively simple procedure once you actually decide you want to do it, is you take a scalpel and you create what's called a chest plate. And that's what you're seeing here. This square is that chest plate. And essentially these cuts here allow this patient to expand their lungs. Um, now, what we're doing here is we're introducing the patient to a lot more risk for infection, particularly if this needs to be done in the field. Now, you're already worried about that with burns anyways, and we will get into that. We'll touch on that, but that's something to be taken into consideration. And it's, it's, a, it's a bad day if this has to happen. It's an even worse day if this has to happen in the field, but this is something to be taken into consideration. If you're seeing a patient who's got really severe burns all over their body, that's, it seems like that would come later in your assessment, but that's a part of your respiratory assessment. You need to notice how much of that chest is burned because that's going to start making it more difficult for them to breathe. So getting into circulation and cardiac status, it is very important. Again, I know so for some of it, particularly the EMRs, get IV accesses, we're getting a little bit kind of above your scope of practice. Um, but even just to know that these patients are going to require fluid resuscitation is very important. Um, this is, so, and again, something you want to stabilize early, if at all possible. They will need, if you've got more than 20% of your body surface area burned, we're, when we talk about the secondary assessment, we're going to talk about total body area surface burned. But if you've got a larger burn, even if it's like, let's say you've got you know, limbs involved, maybe an arm or a leg, and you think, oh, it's not too bad. No, people who have severe burns need fluid resuscitation, very careful fluid resuscitation, and we need large bore IVs for this. And so that's worth taking into account. We can't start IVs over burn tissue if at all possible, which is something that, again, I'm trying to, I'm trying to not make this too, too nurse or ALS oriented. Um, attaching them to the monitor let's say you don't have a monitor let's say your EMR let's say you're just taking a pulse you're expecting a heart rate of 100 to 120 in these people uh, this is somebody who's burnt this is someone who's in pain this is someone who's anxious this is someone who may have inhaled something may have an inhalation injury you want them to be a little tachycardic Somebody whose blood, whose heart rate under 100 given a serious burn is a concern because that means they're bradycardic. Why are they bradycardic? Um, particularly in our older patients who maybe are taking medications to control that blood pressure, to control the heart rate and blood pressure. That may actually, and that's going to cause them problems if that is the case. If the heart rate's more than 120, though, we, you have to then also take into consideration, again, this is your regular trauma assessment. What else is going on? Is that patient bleeding into somewhere? Are they losing volume somewhere? Uh, do they have an underlying diagnosis that may be leading to that increased heart rate? Because that you shouldn't see it go too much above that unless they're incredibly anxious or unless you're looking at something like maybe the a chemical asphyxiant becoming involved. So and we are going to get into, again, I'm keeping the beginning of this a little bit more simplistic for everyone like the Again, the meat and potatoes. There's a bunch of fancy ways to decide how much fluid we need to give these guys. And people are gonna be familiar with the Parkland formula and all the different ways we decide how much fluid we give them. The information that I'm pulling this out of is the American Burn Association from the Advanced Burn Life Support course. Initially, regardless, if you have somebody with 20% or over burn, you wanna give them 500 milliliters an hour of warm fluids. We don't give boluses to these people anymore. We used to be really big on that. We overfluid resuscitated people. Again, we're going to get into that later, but this is not someone you want to throw a ton of IV fluids at. This is not someone who needs to be overfluid resuscitated, given that the burn is the only thing that we're concerned about. 
If we're concerned about trauma and that person's bleeding, we don't want to give them more crystalloids than that anyways. We need to be giving them blood, right? So jump in for one sec here, Bobby, and open a small can of worms while you're talking about this. Absolutely. R ringers versus normal saline, because we don't. <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask me that. Because um, we don't get ringers, and it's a sore point for everyone who's working on car. And and this is going to be a little. This this guy's going to be a little bit over the head of, of some or over the practice level of some folks here. But I, if you don't mind unpacking that can of worms just a little bit, I'd be really grateful. So normal saline, or keeping it relatively simple, normal saline is more acidic than Ringer's lactate. Exactly. Moderate to severe burn, I would say nothing by mouth, no sips of water. Um, again, if we're going to have to establish that airway, we want that stomach empty. And a lot of the, a lot of the time, these guys will be sedated in, as soon as they get to the hospital so that we can do wound care. And if we want to sedate someone quite heavily, we don't want anything in their stomach. Uh, sorry, Nick, to yours, uh, normal saline is, has got a lower pH than Ringer's lactate does. And so theoretically, in someone who's going to become acidotic and a burn patient, a severe burn patient will become acidotic, we want to prevent that. And so they want to give Ringer's lactate. Now I will tell you, and I'm almost entirely positive, I'm still very right about this. There's a lot of research being done about normal saline versus Ringer's lactate. And quite frankly, there is no hardcore definitive research that states that we see worse outcomes in these patients if we give them normal saline versus Ringer's lactate. I see it's very often physician preference right now when I see it. Um, I have a, one emergency room physician when he's running fluids in a trauma patient have, so if he wants a hundred total, He'll do 50 normal saline and 50 ringers lactate. So the ICU doc, when he comes down, can't get mad because he's done both. Because it's that uncertain whether we're really going to have that preference for normal saline or ringers lactate. So hey, I, wait, when you're done, I really want to know who that is. You can tell me later. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, so the official, I mean, in theory, it would be better to have a fluid that wouldn't lend at all to that acidosis. So we say ringers lactate. That is the official guideline from the American Burns Association, but I will say that there is no really strong body of evidence that actually proves that, that that's something that's necessary, which is why I think we probably don't see it on in pre-hospital. The um, military medics and the search and rescue technicians also do not carry Ringer's lactate, and I think it's that lack of hard evidence proving that it's a thing. It's more of a it's a best case scenario, not an absolute necessary because we haven't actually proven it yet. Does that answer the question? <laughs> no, I was waiting for someone to, I was waiting for someone to ask for that. Thank you. Um, so acute burns, and this is directly from the American Burn Association, acute burns don't bleed. You essentially cauterize behind the trauma. And so you shouldn't be seeing a lot of bleeding. If you're seeing a lot of bleeding, there's some kind of underlying trauma and we're missing something and you need to restart your trauma assessment and look at it and find out what is going on there. Um, so assessing circulation, any limb, again, we have that circumferential burns again here. So when you do your respiratory assessment, you're gonna look for circumferential burns around the chest. When you're doing a circul circulatory assessment, you're gonna look for circulation um, around any limb because if, and when there's a burn around any limb, because that is gonna do the same thing as the chest, it's not going to be able to expand and you're gonna see the blood flow to the distal portion. So to the further portion of that arm or that leg also potentially slow down or stop. And that becomes, that makes it more of an emergency. Now a burn is an emergency anyways, but there's a big difference between, oh, we've got 30, 40 minutes to get this guy to the hospital versus there's no pulse in this arm. We need to get them there now. Um, also again, a good point uh, is early in your assessment. If you have a circumferential burn, you're probably not going to see the loss of that pulse, but you want to establish when the pulse was lost. Mm -hmm. So if you can establish on scene, there's a pulse in this limb and how, you know, there's still a pulse, there's still a pulse. And we know that we lost the pulse just as they were getting to the hospital. That may, may make the difference between the surgeon saying, well, let's save the arm or let's not. So if you see those circular, if you see that circumferential burn anywhere, 
You need to assess distally, which just means farther away from the heart. You need to assess if they've still got blood flow to that area. And the thing is, the reason those circumferential burns are going to cause that issue is because everything's about to get very puffy. And we're not going to get into in depth yet about capillary leak syndrome, but the circulation in the, in the meat and potatoes version of things, circulation gets very, very wonky with burns. And it doesn't just get wonky in the area that's actually burned. You're looking at a mass kind of systemic inflammatory issue now. Just because the burns up here doesn't mean you're not going to start seeing a bunch of fluid doing funny things in other places. And that's why we worry about that fluid resuscitation. It's why it's so important. And so another really simple for the EMRs, a really simple thing that you really need to do right away, rings. Take the rings off the patient. Take any jewelry off the patient. Um, not just, and the jewelry can be hot as well and may have contributed to the burn, but everything is about to become very sausage-like, swell up quite a bit, and you want to take anything that's around something off, rings, watches, belts, um, because everyone, the, because you're going to see everything get very edematous here. And so that's something that's really important to take into account as well. Um, yeah, I've covered them make sure I'm not missing any details here. I'm kind of roughly, for those curious, following along the um, acute burn life support manual. This is obviously, that's an eight hour course and I'm doing this in an hour. So I'm missing a fair bit of the detail, but I should be covering the basics for what you need for burn care for pre-hospital. Um, now head hypothermia, this is a military difference. Um, that fourth, we go airway, breathing, circulation, and then we go straight to head, which is neuro and other places is a little bit different, but either way, check how awake that patient is. We go back to that level of consciousness. Are they alert? Are they anxious? Is this somebody who's having trouble sitting still? Is that because they're hypoxic? Um, it, have they hit their head, right? Uh, are we don't think, oh, they inhaled a bunch of smoke and that's why they're sleepy. Do your proper neuro assessment. Has this person cracked their skull? Is there something going on in there? Because you can't see that and you get distracted by the really gory looking burn. You miss the fact that one of your pupils is doing something funny, right? And so I've kind of under the head hypothermia area, we're looking at that expose the patient. This is E in several trauma algorithm steps. Uh, the problem with exposing the patient, and that's why I've said hypothermia instead of exposed, is because we don't have the ability to regulate our body temperature when our skin's gone. And so these patients are going to become hypothermic very, very easily. And I'm going to do the old adage of the trauma triad of death here, which the most important part is even if we're at the very basic level, EMR level, the trauma triad of death is the beginning is hypothermia. So for those who aren't familiar, the trauma triad of death is hypothermia, coagulation issues, acidosis. If you aren't at the point where you know the pathophysiology of what happens later, all you need to know is every trauma patient needs to be warmed. I don't know if anyone thought it was weird that we were given warmed fluids to the burn patient, but it's because we aren't, we aren't as worried about the burned patient being hot as we are about them being cold. So when you're doing your assessment, when you're exposing this patient, you want to make sure that maybe you do that in pieces. You can, there's a couple of different kind of creative ways that you can do uh, military. We have a big sleeping bag. We put them in and there's a zipper around the entire part. So you can assess the upper body, then close the sleeping bag, then open the bottom of it to assess the lower part of the body. So you're keeping parts of them covered while you do this. Um, while you're removing that clothing when you're doing this, again, we talk about removing clothing, jewelry, piercings, contacts. That was something I had not previously considered. Um, that would be really unfortunate if your contacts got melted to your eyes. Um, it's something the American Burn Association pointed out it would be very uncomfortable, obviously, but even your eyes become edematous when you get a big burn, especially if there's a flash burn or a thermal burn to the face the eyes are going to become more edematous and that burn is going to get worse. And so if those contacts didn't immediately start having a problem, they will later check if that person's got contacts and get them to take them out because those can cause big problems as well. Diapers. Come, come back really fast while we started. Uh, just back to the, the, the hypothermia and warming and stuff. Uh, we, we talked about uh, some burn cases during a, a, a work case rounds event a couple of weeks ago. And uh, there was a, or, sorry, about traumas. 
And there's a really good piece of advice, and I know this is maybe not as accessible to you in the ER, but all of our ambulances uh, with the ambulance service and all of our mobile first aid posts or whatever we're calling them with St. John do have very, very, very high powered um, HVAC systems built into them basically, where yeah. we can modulate the temperature of that patient compartment by about 25 or 30 degrees quite quickly. Perfect. Um, if uh, the, the advice that was given, I thought this was fantastic, is that if you have a major trauma patient or a burn patient, every, every clinician or practitioner in the back should be absolutely sweating through their uniform. And if you're not sweating through your uniform, you don't have the heat turned up enough yet, um, just as a thought. But um, we, and we see this with the military, the same thing. Instead of assessing your patient outside, which is easier because you've got more space and you can have more people consider taking them into the back of whatever vehicle it is you have or inside wherever you can into a warm place before you start taking it's a little difficult I and again it's going to be case by case basis but what if you have a patient who's got you know synthetic clothing on that's still burning or melting you do need to get that off um, and you don't want to delay that to get them into a warm place, but at the same time, you also don't want to strip them naked outside. So it's going to be a little bit of critical thinking, depending on what you have just encountered. Um, yes, one of the things we do see. So again, I, some, a lot of my anecdotes are kind of military here, but the military gives you underclothing, which is not particularly comfortable and doesn't look particularly good and nobody likes it. And so when they went on deployment, when they went to Afghanistan, a bunch of people bought um, from there's a couple brands that sell uh, clothing that looks like military so that the military will buy it and they're made of much more comfortable much cooler and much nicer looking materials which is great until you encounter an explosion and it melts instead of burns like cotton which is what it is that they have us wear people wearing synthetic clothes it's going to melt to you you're actually gonna like, you're not gonna be able to get that off the skin. And so that is gonna, again, create kind of a significant issue potentially. One of the, one of the worst ones I saw was in Kelowna, we had a homeless fellow who was sleeping. He had taken a bit of alcohol and heroin in his system. He was very comfy. Uh, it was cold outside. So he was wrapped in quite a few layers and a sleeping bag. We're not sure what started the hedge next to him on fire, but something did. And he, his sleeping bag lit on fire. And it was very, very difficult. The paramedics, it was beyond the, the paramedics got off what they could, but a great deal of time and effort went in essentially to trying to tell what, what we could salvage for skin versus what this, cause it was like a polyester sleeping bag he'd been sleeping in, um, which had just essentially kind of melted onto him. Um, and the longer you leave that on, the potentially the worse the burn could get. So those are all things you have to take into consideration and things I can't give you exactly the right answer to right now. It's something you're gonna have to deal with on a kind of a case by case basis. One of the things I can tell you is that tar and asphalt are a special consideration. Um, you have to wash those with a great deal of water for a long period of time because essentially they keep burning. Um, and so you need to get it off of the patient and you need to keep it cool if it can't get off the patient. So that's the thing, if you get someone with hot asphalt, it's not gonna come off easily necessarily, um, but you, it's, gonna keep be, it's gonna keep being a source of heat. It's gonna keep burning. It's gonna make things worse since so you have to constantly be washing it. Now, again, we're gonna cover total body surface area burn, but if you have a patient with a small burn, you know, something the size of maybe five of their palms, um, you can cool it with a little bit of cool water at first, but don't put ice, don't make it really cold and don't do it for a long period of time. A lot of people have trouble understanding why, particularly the person who's been burned because the person who's been burned is very uncomfortable. That's the other thing you're going to encounter when you start looking at this. The person who's burned doesn't want to be warm. You're there. Oh, I'm going to keep this person warm. I'm going to make the back of the car really warm. I'm going to cover them up. They're not going to be happy about that. And they're not going to thank you for it because the only way these guys are gonna find comfort at first is for those things to cool. The problem with cooling them, and I find sometimes it helps to explain exactly why we don't cool it. When we cool things, when you particularly if you put ice on something, what does it do? It makes, it cool, it makes your skin cold and white, right? Um, it's because it vasoconstricts. It keeps the blood from getting to the area. Now, what's happening is your skin and the tissues underneath it are dying 
and then you're going to take blood away from the area you're going to you're going to make that death that tissue death so much worse and when when the tissue dies when a cell apoptosis which essentially self-destructs it releases a bunch of toxins into the environment which kills the cells around it so if we can't stop the cell death the cell death travels up and gets worse and so by cooling something too much not just by not just so hypothermia aside by cooling these people causing that vasoconstriction we're actually causing increased cell death which causes increased electrolyte imbalances increased acidosis increased tissue death and significantly worsens their outcomes so one of your responsibilities here is to make sure that despite the patient doesn't want to be warm that you do keep them warm um, Interesting. I so we're talking. So the, the comment is, you're not supposed to put oil on burns. Um, I don't know if I teach long periods of flushing with cold water. Sorry, Mike. Familiar at MFR. What does MFR stand for? That's uh, medical first responders. That's the qualification level, uh, the standard qualification level within St. John. That's loosely comparable to an EMR OFA3 hybrid. So I don't think long periods of flushing with cold water, even for a minor burn, um, long periods of flushing with cold water, if you suspect there's chemicals, if you've got that tar or asphalt, or if you've got something in the eyes, but cool water, I think what you'll find is that what they tell you, especially with a small burn for a hand, it's like a, it's a, it's a cool, so like a, a, a room temperature water, but they don't say cold water or ice. You want to keep running water over it, but you don't want it to be cold. You don't want it to cause vasoconstriction essentially, because if you do, then you're going to make it worse. And Carly, you shouldn't put oils on burns. Um, I don't know specifically about getting that asphalt off and if diesel or oil like whether that helps, but the oil on a burn specifically makes burns worse because it actually keeps a lot of the chemicals inside the burn that you don't want inside the burn that we flushed off with that water. Um, we used to have that for that same reason, actually, here's another good thing. People used to put butter on burns. People used to put polysporin on burns, a lot of petroleum fat-based things because, and we're skipping ahead a little bit here, but bear with me when the nerves are exposed, it hurts. It hurts a lot. You want the nerves not to touch the air. And so that is really easily achieved by putting something oily or something um, petroleum based over it uh, so that the, you can't, it keeps all the air from hitting those nerves. And so that makes it feel better, but they did actually show that that causes worse outcomes. You're looking at containing in a bunch of essentially the the problem chemicals that are in that burn and making things worse. Yeah, I don't know about asphalt. The, I, all I'm getting the asphalt tar thing from is actually the American Association, um, American Burn Association. It says the one time you're allowed to throw a great deal of water on is for tar and asphalt. And they don't go into much more detail beyond that, unfortunately. And so that's where I was pulling that information from. So, and this is actually, this leads into this really nicely. Once you are, once you've got that, like all the burnt clothing off, any kind of danger things off the patient, what you're going to cover that patient in is a clean, dry sheet. We have really particularly pre-hospital wise started moving away from it needing to be absolutely sterile, from it needing to be a fancy dressing, from it having to have a bunch of this cream on it or that cream or make sure it's not going to stick if at all possible, um, is really helpful for the patient. And I know there's special burn blankets that most services carry. One thing that I know the medics, this is the, the medics in the military carry is um, saran wrap. So the process of making saran wrap actually, because of how hot it needs to be, actually causes it to be sterile. And saran wrap is clean, it's dry, it's non-stick. Again, you don't want to make it circumferential. You don't want to wrap it like this. But in the absence of something else, with a burn, laying a layer gently of saran wrap over it, if you don't have something else that's non-stick, 
is something that is a viable option, to be honest with you, though what they are, what the American Burn Association recommends, clean, dry sheet. Again, the patient's not necessarily going to thank you for this, um, but it, it's, it's, it's the best thing you can do for the end outcome. So all these things I'm saying need to be temporized to a certain extent with the fact that these people are very uncomfortable and that they're going to be really unhappy about this. And I will tell you in all honesty that in my practice in the hospital with someone who's got a burn, let's say just on the hand, I will bring them cool water and I will let them have that hand in the cool water more than these, the recommendations allow sometimes just if it's going to control that person's pain and that person's anxiety. Um, so again, things to kind of take into account. A young healthy person, for instance, a young otherwise healthy person who if with a small burn, is it going to cause severe hypothermia if we put cool water on this? Probably not, right? What if you've got somebody older, someone immunocompromised, something like that, or a child who had body temperature regulation issues anyways, something to take into consideration. So now that, so that, that was the part you needed to know. That was essentially your trauma assessment. That was burn specific considerations for your trauma assessment. Those are the things that you want to make sure you kind of keep in mind when you walk yourself into a situation that involves something that has got a burn to it. Getting into the weeds a little bit more. Um, and it's, I'm just going to pull it together a bit. We've already talked about all this. When you're looking at the skin, which is considered an organ, it's the largest organ in your body. It's made of three layers. And these three layers of skin do very important things. They protect you from the environment. They regulate how much fluid and electrolytes we have in our body. They regulate your temperature and they regulate your, your sensory perception. Those are all things we've already talked about. That's essentially kind of what we are pointing our practice towards when we start looking after burns are all the issues of taking those systems and causing problems. So thermal regulation, for instance, we talked about the fact that these people are so much at risk for hypothermia, fluid and electrolyte imbalance, why it's so important to make sure we start fluid resuscitating these people. Protection from the environment, it's worth mentioning that these people have a huge chance of infection now that they don't have that protection from the environment. And we also talked about the fact that you don't have protection from them now. They don't have protection from the environment, but you don't have a protection from their bodily fluids either. And you need to take that into consideration as well. Sensory perception really we think dominates the pain aspect of this. That's something that is very important in these patients. More gross pictures. Um, I uh, apologize for the baby picture. I know that can be hard for some people to see, but I cannot tell you how many times kids grab the hot thing. Um, every, <laughs> it's a very, very common thing that I see in the emergency room. Somebody leaving hot tea, hot coffee on the counter, kid reaches up, grabs it every time. Um, so we're going to start the reason I've got these variation of pictures here. <laughs> okay. Peter Thompson's pictures, uh, or Peter Thompson says, send up to obstetrics and cover a bad burn with placenta. I have not heard of that personally. Um, and so I can't speak to it. I would be guessing if I spoke to that. <laughs> I think it's, that exceeds, exceeds MFR scope across the board. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, just, please don't. An interesting idea. It's an interesting idea. <laughs> Um, guys, I'm just going to pause you for one second here. Bobby, I just realized that as, as I was sitting here reading and laughing at Pete's comment here, I, uh, I realized time got away from me a little bit because I was actually enjoying your talk so much. Um, this might be a really good opportunity, guys, for everyone to do uh, a quick attendance run here. So anyone who is an EMR or PCP or ACP or anyone who wants CME credits from their licensing body and who needs a certificate to do that or to get that, um, in the next minute or so, please type both your name and your email address into the chat, and we will make sure we get a certificate out to you in the next week or two. Um, if you don't need a certificate for licensing, please, um, please, uh, uh, please don't ask for one. Pete, I'll ask you to actually type your email address in because the way I actually collect these, I, it's a long story, but I actually search for the at symbol to help me find all the email addresses when I go through the chat log. So please just type in the. Uh, 
type in the name and the email address. If you don't mind, guys, do it on the same line. Just makes it easier for me to find. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll, uh, as everyone does that, I'll let Bobby keep uh, keep going. And we have more questions on the placenta now as well. Is it, was that a... <laughs> no placentas. <laughs> I where I first went with the placenta is just that it's got it'd be like um when we when we do burns um in further into the hospital care you we can do allosteric um skin grafts so when you're taking your own tissue and you're putting your own tissue over it you can take dead tissue and put it over it still works um like a because it's got all the right things in it it's got all the right electrolytes it's very high in iron i don't know that the placenta actually has stem cells in it necessarily but i know that it would essentially act as an allosteric bandage and i mean let's be honest it's what else are we using it for i suppose um because we kept them in the fridge oh my goodness we could go into so many ridiculous reasons why we put why we would put placentas on burns that's going to get very inappropriate uh, <laughs> yeah i would be guessing i would be guessing and i would think it would have something to do with the fact that it contains all the things that your body needs to heal and it would just sit there and keep the air from getting at it i will look that up after And feel free to keep going, Bobby, while everyone's typing their email addresses in here, too. All right. So your secondary survey is kind of everything else. It's your history. The weight, again, being important here because fluid resuscitation for these guys is so important. That's something in the field that you're probably, I mean, if you've got, if you're, if you've got a fancy stretcher that you can zero and put the weight on, but it's probably not your immediate concern, to be honest with you that more careful head to toe. And then the things that are really important here is kind of the depth of the burn, the total body surface area burned, um, which is what I'm gonna talk about. When we talk about burn depth, we went over those three layers of skin with the epidermis. And then we've got the, here. Um, so there we go. You've got your epidermis, you've got your dermis, and you've got your subcutaneous tissue underneath. Subcutaneous tissue is just a fancy word for fat, fat, muscle, bone, everything under there. The important thing, honestly, about this to notice is that you have got nerves that come out to that first, um, first level of skin. Once we burn past that second level of skin, you generally can't feel anything. Third degree burns look absolutely terrible, but are a lot easier on the patient than those surface burns are because the surface burns are where those nerves live and it's the nerve endings coming out that are gonna cause that pain. These are three fairly good examples of kind of, you're looking at first on the left here, bad sunburn. Second, which is also interestingly enough, a bad sunburn. And then third up in the top right. So one thing I wanna say, and this is this isn't this is my own personal experience is that pre-hospital in an immediate stage of seeing a burn, uh, a burn on the skin is going to do the same thing an inhalation injury is going to do. It's going to get worse as time goes on. So you doing you delaying transporting a patient to get a very good assessment of what depth and um, extent of a burn you have. I would argue is not a useful tool because that burn will not make itself known until several hours afterwards. A good anecdote that I have about this, and I know I'm gonna get, I'm, I've, I've been enjoying myself too, and I've been talking for too long. So we're gonna, I'm gonna start talking a little faster here. We had a fellow come into Victoria who, while he was in the house, he'd left his cigarette on the deck and the deck lit on fire. And he ran out very bravely. What he, he was asleep, well, he was in bed in the house anyways, and he didn't have any clothes on. So when he went out to get this fiery couch off his deck, he did so very much naked. He lifted the couch up, threw it over the deck, ran downstairs and put it out with the hose. He was a very brave man. <laughs> but uh, when he came in, he came in covered in what looked like a first degree burn, like a sunburn. He had a bad sunburn. At first, in some areas, he didn't even appear to have that, with the exceptions of the bottoms, bottoms of his feet, which had third degree burns. He didn't look bad. 
in the course of the next three hours, I watched most of those first degree burns turn to second degree burns. Um, areas of his body that didn't look burned at all turned into second degree burns. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed, but when you go out in the sun, you don't notice, oh, look, I'm getting a sunburn. A lot of the time you come in and you wait a couple hours, you notice, ooh, ooh, I was out in the sun too long. I've gotten burnt. So the really early, like it's worth noting as much as you can the severity of the burns, but considering hypothermia, considering um, we need to get these patients to higher care, I don't think that it needs to be a priority to do an incredibly detailed secondary head to toe assessment to attempt to decide what the depth of the burn is in a pre-hospital patient. Um, again, if anyone has heard any different, we can totally argue that, but I feel fairly confident about my stance on that one. This again, for that reason, I don't know that this is as important for you to know. This is what we base that total body surface area burnt on. And so this is just kind of a very easy way that we use the rule of palms. It's the palm or surface of the hand is 1%. So when we talked about that 5% body surface area, I said about five of these, right? And you're looking at that whole hand, by the way, it's called the rule of palms, which is silly because it's not the palm, it's the whole hand. And your own hand is that 1% of the body. And then you'll see the rule of nines here on the little diagram. But again, I would argue that in a pre-hospital setting, do we need to be sitting there trying to decide this? Even in an emergency room setting, I don't, like this isn't something that we make a gigantic priority. If you're in the ICU and you're gonna have this patient for weeks and you've got a ton of time and you wanna do, and you wanna get really, you know, nerdy about how much fluid you're giving them, then I think maybe it becomes a little bit more important. But this is something that gets taught a lot when we learn about burns. And it's something that I don't think we need to focus on as much. One of the things we need to be really aware of, and again, I alluded to this earlier, is essentially burns cause capillary leak syndrome, which means that even if you're burnt here, the fluid's gonna go wonky everywhere. And it's not just gonna go wonky in outside, it's gonna go wonky inside. Wonky being the technical term, obviously. <laughs> essentially, the systemic inflammatory response in your body is gonna cause all the cells in your body to start releasing fluid in ways that they wouldn't normally. It's a lot like septic shock. It's a lot like anaphylaxis. It's a lot like um, neurological shock, all those kind of systemic issues. And that's why we're so worried about fluid resuscitation in these patients. And you see a lot of the time you see um, things like abdominal compartment syndrome because of it. You see these long, and this comes way down the road. This is when we start playing in the ICU, when we start seeing these things happen. And so the one thing we talked about really good burn care at the beginning being really important and having good outcomes, good burn care also means not making it worse. One of the ways we can really easily make this worse is by filling these patients with fluid. We, we're, we're doing it with good intentions, but when we do it, that fluid doesn't go the places we want it to. It leaks into the places we don't want it to. And it starts causing compartment syndrome in places we can't control like the um like the lungs for instance particularly with inhalation injury if you anything you give the iv can start leaking into the lungs it can start leaking into the belly it can start leaking into the limbs and decreasing the amount of circulation we have in the limbs we don't bolus these patients anymore for this reason and that's why i was really kind of harping on that earlier um and so this happens in that first six to 12 hours post burn we're talking pre-six hours right so you're not going to see capillary leak syndrome. If you throw a bunch of fluids at these people, you're going to think that it's going well six hours later. That's when we're going to see the problem. And that's why we need to be very aware that our resuscitation pre-hospital is very, very important. Um, and there we go. There's the slide on all the things I just talked about. Um, so I forgot about cerebral edema. You can also get fluid leak into the brain. Basically, anywhere that fluid wants to go, the fluid can go. For the people who are a little bit more advanced in their practice, it's also why we don't use colloids in the first 12 hours is because capillary leak syndrome can also leak proteins. And so if we give colloids, we're just going to allow the protein in those colloids to go into those to third space. And we're actually going to make that worse. Um, the military does use those colloids early, but even then I think it's only, it's not before that first 12 hours. Um, I'm going to kind of, we can sail over. Again, I've got the Parkland formula in here. That's how we used to fluid resuscitate. We don't use the Parkland formula anymore. It used to be four 
milliliters per kilogram of fluid. It's now two, arguably, honestly, the most up-to-date things that we do, again, for anyone who works in the hospital, what we do now is we base the fluid resuscitation on how much comes out. You put a fully catheter in really early, and we put in what comes out, and we keep them um, we keep the right amount of fluid in the body. So instead of coming up with the math and deciding how much fluid we're going to give right now, we decide how much fluid we're going to give depending on how much fluid that patient needs. If you have 25 come out the catheter, you put 25 in the IV, that kind of idea. And there's a bunch of protocols for that. Um, Vancouver Children's Hospital's got a very, uh, very good up-to-date one, actually. They're kind of on the, the cutting edge of that because pediatrics, obviously, pediatric burns can be Quite a bit worse than adults just because they're kids but also because they don't handle their body fluids as well as we do in that they get they shift very easily and they're made up of more fluid than we are and this is the last slide here again this is a lot of the things on the slide aren't really pre-hospital necessarily unless you're als but what i really basically want to push here is that pain control is incredibly important for anyone who's had any kind of burn any, I'm sure everyone's had something small or a sunburn or something at some point in time. It's incredibly uncomfortable. Um, you don't usually get, we talk about third degree burns being easy for the patient, but you know what happens around a third degree burn? A second and then a first. The only time I've ever seen a third degree burn without anything near it, this girl was a glass blower and a piece of liquid glass fell boop, right in the middle of her hand and she had a perfect little black circle in her hand and she couldn't feel a darn thing. Usually if you get a thermal burn, next to that area of third degree, you're gonna get areas of second degree and first degree. And so you're gonna have a lot of pain. Air currents hit those open nerve endings. They cause a lot of, a lot of discomfort. You wanna cover these people. Again, the reason that the military medics carry the saran wrap is because it, apparently it's very effective for keeping that, those air currents off. And so it's effective means of pain control. Um, and we get very fancy with the kinds of kinds of analgesia analgesia that we use for these patients uh, whether we use opioids or ketamine i'm not going to get into the ketamine argument now it's kind of out of the scope of this of this talk but it's just something that you need to take into consideration you need to know um, and if you have a really anxious patient who's in a lot of pain and you're not dealing with that pain well you know what they're going to do they're going to leave they're going to walk away from you pre-hospital you can have someone with a fairly severe burn who needs care turn around and go find water somewhere where they can put their hand in water if you're not helping them with that pain enough. Um, and then you're going to, obviously that patient's going to deteriorate and that's going to be more of a problem. And so you have to sometimes find that middle ground between I'm not supposed to put cold water on this, but this patient's going to walk away from me right now if I don't do something. And I think that effectively covers the whole PowerPoint slide. Uh, and I'd be, I, I'm free as long as anyone else is free, Nick, if I, if anyone has questions and wants to answer questions, I don't have a really desperately hard timeline on this. Absolutely. As, as with any in-person lecture, there's normally about a minute or two of deafening silence until someone, uh, until someone breaks things and uh, <laughs> decides to be the first penguin over the edge of the cliff. Um, <laughs> I, I that was a great talk, Bobby. Thank you. I uh, I, I genuinely uh, I genuinely really enjoyed that and did actually lose track of time myself as I was uh, as I was sitting there and sort of soaking all of this in. Um, burns are one of those things where we don't necessarily see a huge number of them. I mean, certainly not to the same uh, to the same extent that we see uh, you know musculoskeletal injuries and rolls and sprains and fractures and all this sort of stuff, right? Um, and it, it, it's really it's really good to have a, 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 a review and an overview of all this stuff. Um, I can maybe share uh, two stories very briefly, just while I'm trying to encourage everyone to come up with some questions. Uh, 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 um, there's 45 of you guys. Come on. Uh, <laughs> someone's got to come up with something here. Um, but I, I, I use this as an example of what not to do. Um, it's a story about myself and one of my very first patients. Um, that I ever cared for back when I was uh, stationed out in Port Renfrew. And uh, I had a patient who uh, had about 30% about second and third degree burns, a large portion of one leg, a large portion of their torso, a large portion of their chest. And we're bringing this person 
into Victoria General, and they uh, they were obviously in a lot, lot, lot of pain. And uh, as you guys know, I'm sure uh, basic life support ambulances don't have a lot in terms of analgesics that are available to them. And the only thing that I could offer this person that was really effective for their pain management uh, was to hang a 1,000 mil bag, a one liter bag of saline, um, hook up a drip set, and then just let them like, and then open it up and then just let them trickle drip water all over themselves. And it gave the patient something to do. It distracted them a little bit and it gave them some moderate amount of pain relief in between the distraction and the cool flowing saline. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I thought this was great. It's fantastic. They're feeling way better about this. Um, you know, they went through one bag. I hung a second for them. Uh, for, for those of you guys who don't know, this is about an hour and a half to an hour 45 away from the nearest hospital. Um, but essentially, they, you know, I hung one bag, it went, went great. I hung a second bag, it went great. By the time we got to the hospital, this person had gone through, I believe, 12 or 13 liters of saline drip cooling themselves. And to be fair, they were they had some fairly significant and very, very painful burns. Um, and as I was doing my handover at BGH, I realized, wow, they're really shaking and shivering a lot. <laughs> and I had actually, I had actually let my patient push themselves, or I had pushed my patient into a mild hypothermia by overcooling. And you know, I believe that person, from what I understand, that person had a, a positive outcome. They they got proper therapy and treatment. They had, you know, they had a good outcome at the end of the day. But it was a really, really good lesson for me in how easy it is. This person is a, I don't know, a, a slight of build young female patient who, who you know, uh, probably was maybe 120 pounds or something like that. And it just had 13 liters of cold or cool or cold fluid poured on them. Um, uh, and it was just, it was a really good, uh, it was a really good reinforcing lesson for me on, on how easy it is to overcool patients. So um, I try to share that lesson because it was it was at my own expense. It was my own learning experience and, and practice education, the, experiential practice education. The saline, the saline tubing idea, though, is one thing that we do use, actually, if it can keep sometimes a patient from dumping copious amounts of cold water on themselves, especially if it's a hand burn or something. Yep. It, it's a really good way. And again, as you say, it distracts them. You give them the end of the IV line and you let them kind of drip that saline over if you're going to moderate how much they dump on themselves and give them something to distract them it's a good way to do it yeah you don't was, want to do 13 liters yeah <laughs> and i just kept going we actually stopped at souk to pick up a couple extra bags of saline on the way in and was, you know and then by the time we were done i was like oh i really shouldn't have, i should have i should have watched that more carefully oh well um does anyone have uh I, i'm seeing a dearth oh here we go we have a question from sarah uh, 597 um when you have someone with something melted or stuck to them, how do you decide when to stop trying to remove it? Oh, that's a good question, Bobby. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> these, it, it depends how bad the burn is. As soon as it sticks, really, you don't want to start pulling skin off because even if that skin is dead, again, we talk about an allosteric bandage. It just means a bandage of your own skin, even if the skin's not alive anymore. And it's better to leave the skin intact than it is Oh, this is actually, this is a really good blisters. Do you pop blisters? Not pre-hospital. No, you don't, not on burns. Um, and for the reason is just that you have this ability to protect the skin right now um, or to protect the under underneath the skin, even if you leave dead skin on. And so if you go to pull something off and it doesn't just lift off, the idea is you're not really pulling so much as brushing is what I've been taught in a couple courses. If you go to brush something and it brushes off, then fine. But if it takes any kind of force, at that point, you're leaving it. If, if it's hot or if it's burning, you pour water. Like that's when you put some water on it for something to make it stop burning. Um, but you don't want to make them any further at risk for infection than they already are. I've got to. Uh, I've got to be honest, Bobby. You did such a good job. I'm not sure that I actually have any pressing questions um, cool. jumping I, at me. Again, right guys, now. I really, I, I, I tried to stick fairly loyally to the American Burn Association's advanced uh, burn uh, life support. So those are uh, that's all your basics. That should be the things you really need to know for kind of that immediate pre-hospital. What I would say 
for my fellow nerds out there, if anyone's interested, specifically if you do some like more advanced, if you're looking at um, in hospital or ALS care, the MCRIT podcast, um, E-M-C-R-I-T, uh, has four episodes on burns, the f- which are all absolutely fantastic. And they, it doesn't, it gets a little bit more into the weeds again, but if you were interested in what I was saying and you want to know more, essentially, I would recommend that as a really good resource for something to listen to. Um, removing contacts. Ooh, interesting. I would want to try and get that person to remove their own contacts, to be honest with you, before I went sticking my fingers in anyone's eye. If you can ideally get them to do it themselves, that would be great. My concern would be if they had melted to the eye at all, how are you going to know? How are you going to know? How are you going to get that out? Um, The only reason that I know how to put contacts in or out is because we use the lenses that we flush eyes with in the emergency room. I don't know about MFR. Nick? I I was just going to jump in there, actually. I am... I'm pretty sure there is actually, if you go back to your MFR textbook, there is actually an illustration, I think, that talks about how to basically very gently pinch and remove a contact. Um, the, uh, the, the catch, as Bobby has, has hit the nail on the head here, is, is that if they are in any way fused to the surface of the eye, if there's any resistance, any difficulty, any uncertainty if there is in fact a contact lens there because if you wear contacts you'll know that they're not always super obvious um you know uh i uh, i get the patient to do it themselves or leave it to someone who's done it before and knows what they're doing would be my would be my advice um if you're a long transport time away from further care or help um you're gonna have to do what you can but um there was a question, Bobby, I think that got uh, that got buried a little bit farther up here from Michael Dusso, um, asking about fireworks or phosphorus burns, and if you had any thoughts on how to manage those. Oh, interesting. It has been such a long time. I did see a young, we saw a guy in Penticton who had blown his hand off because of fireworks. Um, Yes, sorry, and I got distracted. Andy, yes, make sure you let whoever know you're handing off to that they have contacts, that's great. Um, I'm trying to remember what kind of, there's a, t- there's a particular type of chemical burn that requires, it's calcium, it's glass etching burns um, that require immediate intervention with, of all things, KY jelly and calcium um, because it can actually deplete the calcium in your body, so that's, um, glass etching chemical. As far as phosphorus burns go, all I, my only background is the, from phosphorus gas from chemical warfare. And again, it's really just symptom management, unfortunately. In a lot of instances, when you look at chlorine gas or phosphorus gas, phosphine gas, and mustard gas, once you have encountered that, there's really not a lot you can do besides manage those symptoms Um, any dry powder on the patient should be dusted off. Otherwise, wash the chemicals off if you can. And keep in mind, it is a chemical burn, which means it can cause more issues than what you might be like, than something just the simple thermal burn, and it can get on you as well. So if you have someone who's got some kind of like spray back from some kind of chemical on a, on a fireworker or anything from even organophosphates, uh, if you're looking at commercial commercial uses of organophosphates, which are used in, or I saw it a lot in Kelowna because they used it in pesticides in orchards. Um, it's something that you don't you can't you don't necessarily see, but you touch the patient, it gets on you, or you inhale it, which is again why it's so important to wear PPE with these guys. Um, but yeah, nothing. Nothing immediate or special you can do beyond just look after the look after the symptoms. Now that's to my knowledge. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean there aren't things out there. White phosphorus, yes, is a whole different. Sorry, someone, Alan is sending me a message about white phosphorus from smoke grenades. Uh, white phosphorus is a whole different uh, end game in that it doesn't stop burning until it doesn't have oxygen and you have to hold them underwater. Um, uh, 
Michael, just, just so is that what you were asking about phosphorus? Are we going as far as to do like really bad phosphorus burns, what we see phosphorus burns in air. And so this is one of the examples of when you would be able to cool them, not cool them necessarily, but you would have to hold them. My grandfather actually, so anecdotally here, World War II had a white phosphorus grenade go off in his hand. And they had to hold him in a horse trough for two hours with just his mouth sticking out uh, until they got the medics there to be able to take the phosphorus off. And I don't know that I would be able to tell you how to go about getting that phosphorus off either. I just know that you need to keep them in water or in oil. But I don't know, we haven't seen weapons like that in such a long time that I don't know the immediate care. I, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm gonna say that I think it's very unlikely that any of us are gonna encounter white phosphorus burns. So the one time you, you, so don't, the one, the one thing I will say is that the military still uses white phosphorus. They use white phosphorus, they do do it in exercises in Victoria. Mm. And they are very careful when they do it. But if it went wrong, it wouldn't be the military medics dealing with the situation. It would be, they would call the ambulance. So on a very, very low chance you deal with it, but you'd potentially get called to one of the military sites in Victoria to deal with an, in, an injury from that. Well, you, I've just jinxed myself, Bobby. Yeah, and now it's going to be <laughs> you, Nick. <laughs> um, oh, geez. Um, on, uh, on that note, guys, if there's no uh, if there's no further questions, I see Brian Mikalski says uh, white phosphorus for signaling enemy presence. Um, yeah, if uh, if there's no further questions from the group, guys, um, I think we'll call it an evening. Uh, thank you so much, Bobby, for your time as always. An absolutely uh, fantastic lecture, fantastic content. Um, we really really appreciate having your uh, having your time for this. Um, thank you everyone for showing up again. But if anyone does want to get a hold of Bobby, uh, you guys do all know how to reach out to myself or uh, Anna. Um, and uh, we're, we're very happy with Bobby's permission to put you directly in touch and stuff. So um, with that, have a lovely evening, folks. Have a great night. Go and enjoy this lovely spring evening. I hope it's lovely for everyone. That's certainly lovely for us here right now. It's like 13 degrees and clear out right now. Um, and um, yeah, take care, guys. We'll see everyone next week. Thank you.